Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking to entrepreneur, author, investor, and legendary natural gas trader Bill Perkins on what it takes to survive and thrive trading in the energy markets. Bill has had a 20 plus year career trading natural gas and other energy commodities with Enron, Centaurus, and is now the founder and principal of Skylar Capital, an energy hedge fund. As always, if you enjoy the show, please leave us a review on the platform you're listening on, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Bill, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Essentially, we're talking about the surviving and thriving trading gas and power, predominantly in Europe and the US, over the last 20 years and what has been an incredibly volatile space, both in the markets themselves and the participants, with a lot of sort of exogenous factors coming in impacting it, and trying to thread through what are the commonalities between those organizations and individuals that have managed to stay relevant and successful throughout. Before we kind of bring it up to the present day, I want to go back to really the the start of gas and power trading, the start of your career in it. Could you set the scene? What In those very early days, what were the markets like and, and what were the organizations and the structures behind them that were starting to trade gas and power? I mean, if we're going way early, I, I started off as a screen clerk, right? They just deregulated natural gas. The New York Mercantile Exchange started to open up a futures contract. It was mainly a heavy end-user pipeline gas marketer market a lot of bilateral trades. So it was people just offloading hedges from small producers, aggregating producers, and now using the futures markets where uh, speculators were coming in, try- acting as risk warehousers to balance the market. When I finally got onto a desk in Houston around 1995, it was still pretty much the same. It was wild west of people, you know, when you have a new commodity, not as much liquidity as you would think would be needed a growing market, growing supply, growing demand, and mismatches along the way, you know, what was the status quo might have been baked into the psychology of some of the people that got into the trading market, but it was about to get much wilder because it was deregulated. So you had these inefficient markets and you kind of had this, the existing pool of talent was very physical, very focused on the actual sort of moving the molecules and longer term deals. You, yourself, and others, the market had to draw new expertise, particularly around the derivatives piece, to start to capture the opportunity. Can you talk a little bit bit about that? Like, where did those first traders come from? Yeah, so Enron was one of the largest, what I call suckers of talent across the country, of just bringing in smart people and and bring them into this space of energy and deregulation and uh, kind of bringing in traders to provide liquidity to price exotic structures for people, et cetera. And all the other firms, the Dynagy's, the El Paso's, the pipeline operators, they were like, oh, we need this expertise. So there was this huge talent drain out of New York and possibly Chicago, uh, and then also out of the business schools, but particularly New York, of bringing brokers and traders to Houston. And when I first got here, there was like a little New York City here of people who had been recruited out of college, recruited from brokerage shops to handle the brokering and, and traders being recruited to manage these direct, these uh, new products that were available to these physical shops. And so it, it was an exciting time because natural gas was a product that I believed in. I, I, I saw the, the efficiency aspect of using it in power plants. I knew that the demand would grow and that there would be a lot of opportunities in a growing field. So what, what did it take then? I mean, all trading is, is obviously having an informational edge, a capability edge. And what did it take then? Enron, obviously one of the most successful teams and, and that alum, you know, including yourself, have gone on to do great things. But what did it take then? What was the edge that enabled organizations to, to win in that environment? An insatiable curiosity and a willingness to learn because there was always something new to learn. The market was growing and changing. This was new to everybody. Things were happening that were new to everybody. And also the the standard trader things like rational, calm, cool head under fire, the ability to not lose your wits and think things through rationally, 
um, and understand kind of where you were in the cycle about liquidity and what's available, right? You know, this this wasn't treasury bills, right? This was niche market and energy, right? That has periods of extreme scarcity and periods of extreme oversupply. And so tying that all together, it took focus and, and willingness to learn. I guess there's always been this, the narrative of this conversation will be about gaining an informational edge and then competitors catching up, you know, and actually the the frequency of that, that turnaround is only increasing. But back then, it wasn't a transparent market in terms of information for traders. So what teams, what, how did you go about getting information that enabled you to put the position, build the fundamental view of the markets that you, you had? You had a team and, and you studied yourself what information, what pipelines, what infrastructure was going in, what happened historically, what demand responses. Certain shops had edges with marketers, right? They're, they're in the streets. They know what's going on, right? They know what their customers are thinking. They have a very good sample size in mass. But I want to go back a little bit. I think there are some markets where the difference between the average person and say the professional is very slim, right? So the professionals have to really fight for this edge. In natural gas trading in the, in the beginning days, there weren't enough risk warehousers for the hedgers, right? Both ways. So we didn't really compete against each other for the amount of capital or the amount of risk we could put on the books. It was never big enough, right? To satisfy the market. We were never competing over trades. So the real thing you needed to do is be better than the average, right? And the average was heavily weighted towards hedgers. And so it was, it was a lot easier to gather information to say, okay, I'm gonna buy this strip, or I'm gonna be long here, or I'm gonna be long this vol, and I'm gonna take on these hedges that are finding their way to me through the market, or be short finding its way to me through the market, building out your models and your, fundament, your fundamental desk. I would think like trading currencies would be like, hyper difficult, <laughs> right? To have an understanding yeah. of what a predictive value. But, you know, in the early days of natural gas, like you're a producer and it's deregulated and prices are X and you're going to make a 30% IRR, you're selling, right? <laughs> so, you you know, like it's not, it's not, you know, your job isn't that hard when your customers are like, listen, I don't care. I want to go golfing and collect my money. Not exactly to that extreme, but they're was saying I want to hedge, right? And you're basically saying, okay, where do I feel comfortable warehousing this risk where the market is going to clear in the future? So that was a, a great part about it. The bad part about it is it's not as liquid and it's wild and it's had extreme sensitivity to weather, right? Things can change on a dime. And so those are the forces you kind of, you know, you kind of got the layup, but then you have this outside variance, right? There's a lot of variance in, in natural gas in, in the earlier days. Yeah. Which made it a lot of fun, you know? Yeah, and some incredible money made, right? But but that landscape, Enron, when you step back, didn't have a huge impact on the market itself. Quickly, in 2003, 2004, okay, you had a change of incumbents. But ultimately, in the 2000s, you had a huge amount of new entrants coming into the space. You got the producers themselves increasingly sophisticated in how they approach the market. You had these, you know, all the merchant utilities come in and particularly you had the banks as well, whose capacity to warehouse risk was enormous. So how did that, how did the landscape change, you know, and it changed quite quickly, but changed in the mid 2000s compared to decade before? I think the structure of the market kind of set up this, this structure where you could kind of design around it, right? So you had you have your producers, right? And they put out public reports and you can see what their hedge ratios are. So they have they have a a rateable, you know, across the curve selling demand, right? The demand for hedges. You also have natural gas added to the Goldman Sachs commodity index, right? So we call it at the perma length or the inflation hedges. And they're concentrated in the first three or four months in that length, right? And then you have Small non-reportables, right? The speculators, they're almost always long, right? I, I think in the history of tracking that, they might have been one month where there was flat or a small short, but they're always long. And so you have, um, when you look at that situation where it's like, okay, I have uh, these producers that want to sell like five-year deals, you know, a million contracts a year or two million contracts a year, whatever, whatever it is. And then I have this massive 
commodity index fund that wants to be long, right? And all the lookalikes that want to be long that, right? And in the front, you quickly see that your job is to balance that market. You're going to wind up being short this period and long rateable against it. And that structure evolving on how the market works was kind of the engine for all profits. Now, granted, you might be like, oh, yeah, I want to go long this period because it's really cold and, and, and the fundamentals, you know, supply isn't enough. It's going to be tight and we're not going to have enough gas for the winter or we're going to reach containment where there's not enough storage and, and prices need to go down. That, that's laid on top of it. But that fundamental structure of rateable seller versus the inflation hedger produces the distortions in the curve to make money. That's the backdrop. But in the context of this discussion, there were also, even before we get to kind of, you know, the real events affecting these markets post financial crisis, incoming regulation, banks leaving, but also ultimately what subsequently transpired to be a decade of low gas prices and low power prices or in less volatility, less opportunity. There were still, back in the 2000s, there were still big losses as well as big wins. And there were those organizations that absolutely thrived in that environment, Centaurus, for example, and others that didn't. What was it? Can you divine for us what enabled organizations, depending on what sort of goals they had in the markets, to have that, whatever it is, that, that winning edge, that 2 to 5% that they have that meant that they won, that others didn't? Yeah, I think it was much easier to have a better fundamental desk than anyone else, right? You know, nowadays you can subscribe to services that only you had back then, right? Complete breakdown. You know, back in the day in natural gas, there was the pyras of the world, right? And they'd have their view and analysis and they'd be missing some things that you were looking at and you would have, but you always want to get what the market is thinking as well. But those services grew. There's a Bentech now and there's, there's, there's a lot more information. Let's say a fundamental desk, an outsourced fundamental desk by subscription is kind of out there. But way back when, you would have to have your own analyst team and your own aggregates and the, and the things you looked at and your own and the only way you aggregated supply. Like now everybody can scribe, subscribe to some service and they'll have a gross up of supply. Not everybody had that back then or a model even built for that. They didn't have people that could figure out what the demand was per degree day accurately. And the myriad of pipelines and interconnections and how the flows worked and when they went down. And so those models... Uh, that you had your analysts build and you had people who knew pipelines and how the, uh, how the market and the infrastructure work gave you a lot of confidence. Also, it's not just, it's not just the, the informational edge, it's the confidence in your model that allows you to size up and to warehouse that position and add to it so you can have, you know, big profits instead of, the, you know, we, you know, we always say that traders never blow up or make a bunch of money when they're kind of like, slightly indifferent, like, I think it's going up, or I think it's going down, right? You, you make a bunch of money when you are highly convicted about the position, or consequently, you get blown up that way, too. And so that comes from a very, very strong, in-depth understanding of your market relative to everyone else, right? So you, you can sit down with your model and say, okay, by this month, the market is going to see what I'm seeing, what I am predicting. And thus the price change will be X. And I feel very confident about this because historically we've always been right about this, or these are the things that have happened, right? Relative to the market. And since the market didn't have that information or they didn't have those deaths, they didn't spend the money, right? The market would have wildly different views of what fair pricing was versus what you may think fair pricing is. Yeah. So you had that increasing transparency across, I guess, democratized all of that information is before i guess i don't want to jump too far ahead but as that information became more freely available you know and you're losing that kind of proprietary informational edge that you have you saw organizations have building these quite large asset footprints especially the majors that enabled them to continue to make a lot of money because they had information that still wasn't available more generally to everyone else is that a fair story because i'm, I'm the backdrop to this as well is like the how the hedge funds have fared and they've and it has it was increasingly hard for them to replicate and find information that wasn't just commonly available. I think it would if they had a lot of assets in a particular region or a particular basis spot, they would have some sort of 
informational edge that allowed them to trade around that. But it requires not only the asset, but the humans that know how to access the market and use the market. And I, I think a lot of times they didn't get that right or didn't want to incentivize the humans to come over and, and do it, right, and take that edge. So some people did it right for a little bit, but didn't incentivize their traders well enough, so they left, right? There's always arguments about, well, is it the asset or the trader <laughs> type thing going yeah. on? You know, people jump and ship, and then people saying, you know, we don't care. This is a, a rounding error versus our pipeline operations business. So what if we make 50 million or 100 million? It wouldn't even be audible because we're a multi-billion dollar company, right? And so they pulled out to not have the headaches, to not have the regulatory risk, those type of things. And so as a, as a market was kind of figuring out like, okay, who wants to be in this kind of trading game and extract value from that? And, and you know, that, that got shuffled around. We saw a, a drain of funds doing that, right? We saw a con consolidation of companies anyway. And then we saw people like, we don't want to do this. We don't care. We'll pay away the market edge to whoever the bank or, 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 or the market, and we'll just plug and do what we do best. Yeah. What was the driver behind that? So you had, and, I, and just take a moment to describe it. So you had like, you know, let's pick a year, right? 2008. You had multiple gas and power trading desks here in North America, also in Europe. They'd be quite heavily staffed, right? So you'd have in each region, a couple of term traders, a couple of cash traders, mid-marketers, and you know, you'd have your fundamental analysts and some quants replicated in each region. So you'd have these 50 person gas desks, right? You know, whether it was at a bank or in the merchant utility, but cycle forwards to 2014, let's say, and the number of organizations trading, as you say, has shrunk dramatically. Banks, merchant utilities, all have pulled out, um, or many have pulled out or sc scaled down, taken risk off. And the desks themselves, the, your, your natural gas desk of 2016 was typically a term trader who could also trade cash, you know, maybe two of them covering multiple regions and maybe you know an operator or something, right? And it was largely housed in one or two in privately owned trading houses. And the landscape was changed dramatically. The number of hedge funds that exited, either through significant losses or just insignificant returns, it was a dramatic shift. What was behind that, do you think? And what was the narrative there? Yeah, I, th I think there's two sides, right? There's the companies, you know, just because I have a bunch of pipeline assets doesn't mean that I'm able to convert that information into money. And it's expensive to have those big desks, right? Some of them went bankrupt or got consolidated. And, and they were like, we're not in this business. We're in the business of getting minerals out of the ground efficiently from a strategic standpoint. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a regulatory nightmare. And, and the regulations got worse and worse over time. They just seem to, things that would be like a, a fine, like a mistake, we're fine now are in jailable offenses. And a lot of people are like, okay, we're out of this, right? <laughs> we have we have more headline risk than money we can make trading. And for the individuals as well, right? It's you know, even if you to just be named or associated was devastating to your career, irrespective of the eventual outcome. And as you say, the fines were tremendous and daily. And uh, I know there's plenty of discussion about regulated the energy markets are compared to some other markets, right? But uh, significant risk for organizations and the people. Yeah, I mean, my opinion is it's crazy. I mean, you, you fund these things and they're going to look for problems and fines, et cetera. And it's just, it changed the risk for some of these, you know, shops, the risk reward equation, significant, right? It's not only can I now can I lose money, but can I make a mistake on a position when limits go in effect and like go to jail? <laughs> you know, this is it just got kind of crazy, right? And so we also had a lot of shops that felt like, okay, I'm a bright guy, I have an analyst, I, I can make money in this in this uh, business, and it's not as it's not that easy, right? And you do have to have a lot of in depth research, maybe more so than some of the guys thought. And then also, I think you have to have a temperament. Traders know that like we're different, right? We don't need five or six good events for every bad event that happens. The emotional calculus won't add up and you'll go crazy. And no, no matter how smart you are, you won't be able to handle that and think rationally if that's what you need, right? That's traders 55, 45, 60, 40. That means like, you know, 40% of their days are bad days, <laughs> right? No, a lot of people can't deal with that, right? And so... 
that kind of stoicism is necessary to be a trading shop. And I think a lot of people got out of it. And a lot of people didn't want to deal with the variance, the inherent variance of being a growing energy commodity. And so the, the regulations, the consolidations, the bankruptcies, et cetera, and we just kind of saw, you know, kind of this mixed return in, in energy where the, the, you know, the pension funds and the investors and the people who actually, the LPs that put capital into this business just it became a pariah. Everybody went into equities, right? Everybody's like, stocks only go up. Why am I messing around here? <laughs> in yeah. commodities, right? And so the capital available to put at risk just shrunk drastically. Like the hardest thing to do is go raise money for a discretionary commodity fund here in, 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 in and maybe, maybe not so much right now, but yeah, certainly yeah. back in 2013, right? Yeah. And you would think, uh, there would be more of an allocation there is for that product. And the guys in the fund to fund businesses, the cycle is turning, they're coming back, et cetera. But essentially there's this weird dynamic where the market was growing from like, I don't know, 50, 60 BCF a day market to, to a 96 BCF a day market here in North America while the risk capital was shrinking. And so you had this scenario where it's like, wow, liquidity is actually drying up when, the market is actually demanding more liquidity. Yeah. So you had regulation, you had headline blow ups and so forth, or whatever it might be that also, you know, and, and, and other pressures coming from outside the market where organizations were getting a lot of challenges to why they were putting risk on, you know, what are the shareholders goals, etc. But was it fundamentally, you know, there in the wake of was shale, right? It comes along, you've got that double whammy of a far more efficient market than in the early 2000s, but you've also got gas going to two bucks and basically staying there. We're just talking about gas right now. And, it, it, you know, was that a major story? And, and did that mean that traders in order to sort of survive, how do they respond to that when kind of the, the opportunity is, has shrunk dramatically? I mean, I, I, I've had some of my best years in bearish markets, like betting it going down. But the, where the capital comes from and the investors, they, you know, they, they generally think long, like it goes up, we make money. Right. And they also get skittish. It's, it's weird because I look at myself and other fundamental traders as insurance agents. We either insuring people from prices going up or we're insuring people from prices going down. And when the bad event happens, it's like it's going to happen. Right. There's a lot of exogenous events and, and particularly the weather right in the winter changes in weather, that's the biggest fundamental in our market, you're going to get hurt. But nobody pulls out of the insurance company when the hurricane hits, right? <laughs> They're like, oh, risk premium is going to go up next year. So let's let's pile back into the insurance company, right? Because then, you know, bid ass open up. People make a little bit more money to make up for what's going on. But here, said hedge fund has a, a bad year, et cetera. People just want to get out. They're like, money can't be made in this place, this space. It's too volatile. I don't want to be in it, et cetera. And I'm like, well, we're insurance agents. This, this is what happens. So I, I think there's some of that going on, like the space becomes a pariah, like that people can't consistently make money. And I think it's also the thinking of, of uh, investors is very path dependent. Yeah. Right. Very path dependent. You could have 20, you can have 20 good years and two bad, but those two bad years better not be in the beginning. Or you're done, <laughs> or anywhere yeah. to be, right? Like, and so, like, that's just just kind of the name of the game. And so, when you have, when you have that, right? They're, they're probably the greatest trader in natural gas. We don't know because they got their two bad years or one bad year where it was in the beginning, and they got wiped out. Their their investors pulled out. People lost confidence. They even lost confidence because they, you know, had people asking them a bunch of questions and they left. Yeah, but you, I mean, I kind of want to emphasize the point, right? Like. 2012, 20, 30, 40 hedge funds dedicated to the gas and power markets. Today, a handful. I completely sort of, there's sort of the, the unknown part of this, which is it does ultimately come down to the traders themselves' skill and attributes, right? And I think that the vast majority of traders are best suited to sitting in a system optimization. You know, there's very few individuals, obviously yourself included, who actually have are are considered 
just phenomenal traders. And it just so happened that you got into natural gas. Maybe today you'd have been in cryptos or whatever it might be, right? Maybe not. But, you know, there, there's kind of that je ne sais quoi of the just the brilliant trader. They have that risk tolerance. They have that detail orientation, you know. But it, it, it's just so striking of that the shrinkage there is there anything that you can yeah, i think it's just i mean this is my i don't have like a bunch of data on this but this is the thing i've noticed I, i've met a lot of bright people who were traders super smart right that that were trading or in shops but they weren't traders right professors can't be traders if trading was who was the smartest there would be guys from mat mit and stanford and professors etc coming down here and doing all the trading but they're not it takes more than that and i i, I think people not just being smart, but curious and open and willing to balance out ideas and willing to handle the stress and willing to handle the violence. There's a, there's a lot more that goes into it. The strongest guy is not necessarily the best boxer. He's not going to win the boxing match, right? And so I think, you know, there's this exuberance of we got these bright guys and we got this X, Y, and Z, et cetera, and they weren't traders. They were pro probably should have been analysts. And then you also have just some people who are just unlucky the path dependency wiped them out right and then you know once you once you get caught knocked out in early on right and let's say in your first five years for whatever reason it's really hard to raise capital again yeah to uh you know it happened to let's just say half the guys got it wrong or a third of the guys got it wrong well they're just not coming back and their investors also feel kind of like do i really even want to be in this space is the next guy I put the money in gonna be do i want to give him the money and and there was just they're looking at the totality of where they can put their money, and they're like, we're out, we're out of yeah. natural gas, we're we're just out. <laughs> like, what? Well, I could just buy Amazon and 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 you know whatever. Like, why am I? Why am I? I got the Fed backing me up all the way. I can make this return. I can lever up here. I can print. Why am I going to go into discretionary long short natural gas? Yeah. Why is that interesting to me? Right. It's also it's also interesting as well because we've kind of alluded to it. Like in comparison to other asset classes, you had this really short window in the nineties, early two thousands, when the best and the brightest of individuals were getting into this space. But it was that very short window when you had companies drawing on top talent, whether it was getting top talent from other trading asset classes or getting them from, you know, you know, the top schools and business schools around the world. And I know that doesn't make a trader, but the, and then you kind of, it quickly got cleaned out and, you know, we haven't had any investment in new talent for a decade, right? Or, you know, there or thereabouts, because for the most part, those organizations that have been trading energy have been pretty flat. They've either been independent trading houses or they've been some hedge funds who aren't developing new talent. It's not like the traditional sources of gas and power trading talent, the utilities and the majors have really been beefing up teams. So you've kind of got this, it's quite a thin cadre of individuals that have the background and the training as well to be able to execute in these markets. Yeah. I mean, there are not that many new dogs, right? They're old dinosaurs like me <laughs> out there. You know, I think the, you know, the Copperwoods of the world and Saracens, maybe they're adding new people, but sometimes they lose their energy desk and the guy quits or then it's like who can be is up to speed or be brought up to speed and who's going to teach and mentor these people this market in order that that, that they can go ahead and make money i've been kind of uh beating the drum a lot like I, i've been going to invest us you know because one of the things i've been talking about is that i was like if you look at the total capital like the var that from going from enrons and the g's and 40 hedge funds right and you, you see like the total number of lots that they could warehouse right and that represents a capital base and you look at it now it's just shrunk incredibly versus the market exploding in size incredibly, right? With shale, right? And there's still these swings. I mean, you know, I know it went down and, it, you know, there's still, there's still needs for hedging and there's still buy side hedging and there's still weather risk and there's thing pipelines going on and hurricanes and new infrastructure projects, right? There's this market that needs us, but we're not, we're not showing up. And so what happens is it makes it more profitable for us that remain, but more dangerous. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's like, it's like, wow, we're going to get paid because the bid ass naturally is open up. There's only three insurance agents and 50 have gone away. But yeah. 
if we need reinsurance and we need to get out, we are going to get hurt. Yeah. We're going to get really hurt really bad because prices have to go to such a level that macro strats and other people and CNBC has to go, well, look at natural gas and then you know, more capital comes in to bail us out, right? Taking on those positions, right? And so an energy transition, right, is going to make that in stark relief. We you know in terms of what that does with natural gas, LNG as a transition fuel, and also as these mark the hydrocarbon markets degrade, the financing landscape behind producers, etc., becomes you know less secure. It's going to be a a bit of a wild ride. Just last question on kind of the barren period. Dare I say it wasn't for everyone, wasn't for you. Did that mean that you had to go if natural gas, because the volatility is so low, even the big swings aren't really you know yielding the kind of returns that they had historically? Did that push traders to get into and funds to get into other opportunities? I'm thinking like you know FTRs was quite a big thing, financial transmission um, rights and so forth on the power side. Did that seek? I know you know you have your VC fund and so forth. Did did people to survive have to go and look at different things? I think I think you know the the talent went where they thought they could make money and they could be funded to make money, right? And so like FTR has opened up and people started trading those things. Those things were were lucrative niche markets where they can make a good amount of money, and if the event happened, they can make outsized returns. And maybe who knows? Maybe that, maybe that's what I should have done, <laughs> gone into those markets, but. Uh, I think they just found better pastures either inside banks that were still warehousing risk and had the, the, the lending relationship in order to get the hedges, right? Or other markets or other industries. A lot of people were like, the hell with this, right? Like I, my, I don't have a, I don't have an investor base that stands behind me in order to weather these storms. This is a high variance market. I have regulatory risk. Every trader is like, after the big event or whatever the move is, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to make any money again. Right? Everybody has that feeling. It's a false feeling. It, something always happens, right? But you do have that feeling like, I'm never going to make money again. Like, there's never going to be any distortions in the curve. And there's always, you know, a distortion that pops up. But it's a manic ride being in energy and commodities. And so, talent, you know, these are human beings that have dreams, aspirations, right? They're going to work to do something. And I, other markets are providing that opportunity where it's biodiesel or FTRs, they're going to go. Yeah, They're going to apply their neurons elsewhere where they think they're going to get compensated. Yeah. And now we're in a situation where there's lots of demand across the board, right? Whether it's producers having to build trading and optimization businesses to get closer to their customers and their needs in this world of energy transition, or it's just returning of volatility. So the thesis is, if I'm getting it right, you know, you've got these markets are more in need than ever of risk management services, the insurance services you talk about. That should mean more and more opportunity. But we still live in a world where the rapidity of markets becoming efficient through digitization, through AI, all these, you know, technologies available, meaning that the, you know, the, the, the race to get that informational edge is furious and informational edges instead of lasting three years because you've got a great fundamental analytics desk it might now only last two months before a competitor replicates what you've done how do you keep ahead of the curve like what you know and maybe some examples um or maybe not <laughs> how do you do that i mean how do you keep ahead to keep that edge well I, i'm gonna first say that i still believe that the market is not yet where i'm competing for a trade right the market is all you can eat right now it actually this market still has to induce it induces me to be long i don't wake up and say i want to be long or i want to be short the market goes to a price where it just basically forces me to be long or forces me to be short because that's my job right and it's distorted and because this market has grown and grown and grown and grown that will always happen so i don't care if another two billion dollar commodity hedge fund comes in here and says i'm going to trade natural gas they're still going to need me at some price that's very profitable. And so, you know, it's, I, I wish I would just say, yeah, I'm super bright and that's why, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm the best. But one of the things I have, a, it's actually a model in one of my companies. Like one of the things I think every trader needs is one of the things I always say is why guess when we can know. And, and I have an insatiable curiosity. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, the thing I focus on is asking questions, like getting the answer 
we can get the answer, right? Like you can get the answer. It's just a matter of how much do you want to pay to get the answer, and is it legal to get the answer, right? Like those, those are the two things. Like you know, whether it's sending uh, sending a guy out in the field, taking satellite photos, getting whatever, and but asking questions. If this happens, what is the result? How does the market move? And what is the probability of this event happening? And being curious. So that you're looking around and asking like, well, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then, and then never going, well, oh, we don't know that. I'm always like, why well, guess when, you, when we can know? And so we develop a lot of tools that help us know or do a lot less guessing than the average shop. As a matter of fact, our tools are, I sometimes question myself because some of the tools we have are pretty expensive relative to the size of our fund. As a matter of fact, I know they are. I know they are. But I have a belief that they'll pay for themselves over time. It strikes me listening to you then. And um, one of the most biggest challenges that over this 20 year span that we're talking is that unlike a lot of markets, the paradigm in energy trading shifts quite rapidly. And that shift has been only increasing. And what happened in the past is not a, you know, necessarily a uh, an indicator of what will happen in the future. And that ability to kind of reinvent, ask those questions, seems to be kind of like a, a common theme about those organizations and those individuals that are still around. And part of the backdrop to that as well is also kind of, dare I say, kind of keeping it real, right? There was a lot of organizations in the 2000s that weren't really paying a cost of capital, that weren't really paying for the cash that they were using because they sat in banks or whatever. But can you talk to that a little? You know, how do you not get up and kind of get and they stay tired in your ways kind of thing? You can't be complacent. And one of the things is you just look around you, like th this market is ever evolving. Like we had the shale revolution, you know, and, and way back then, way back when we had one export facility and we were like, eventually this is going to become more like crude, right? You know, we export three BCF a day, now four BCF a day, seven BCF a day. Now, you know, high print of 13 BCF a day in exports. So you have this, you have this like, wow, we're linked to the globe now. We're more and more, at least one way, linked to the global prices, right? We're producing, you know, total supply, domestic supply, 96 BCF a day at the peak now, you know, 93 now, whatever, whatever happened with the, the freeze offs lately, et cetera. But that's a massive change, right? And then you have all this infrastructure, power plants, and now power plants aren't going in, but now we're, we're, we're shutting off coal plants. Now we have renewable growth year over year, which before it was small, right? Like, well, what happens when it's 10 gigawatts or 20 gigawatts of renewables per year? What happens? And you, you sprinkle it this way. And so there's a lot of different segments that I'll ask a lot of what if and what's going on and a lot of change where you're forced to keep your head on a swivel, right? Like your football coach, you know, Perkins, keep your head on a swivel, damn it. You know, like you got to you got to be looking out because this world, natural gas and energy is changing drastically. Some of it by by force, right? Like if you look at state renewable mandates, that's like huge impact. You know, it's mm -hmm. something we were looking at five years ago, four years ago. Like, how is that going to impact? How does uh how does all this solar and the distribution of the power affect you know peak demand and gas peakers and how how does that how does that happen? How does that what tools do we build to model this correctly? And so you're just constantly asking questions. There's constantly things going on. And now, you know, once you start jumping the pond and you link to the international markets, you've got a lot more to learn about. Like I have to pay attention to Chinese demand, right? I yeah. have to, right now, prices are so high globally, like we're going to be exporting LNG for a while, right? But let's just say it was 50 cents in the money. And all of a sudden, Europe and 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 China don't, don't want the cargoes. What happens if we shut in... What happens if we turn back four BCF a day in the Gulf, given that storage hasn't grown at all, right? <laughs> and so these are the what ifs that I, I think about, right? Like I think, you know, one of the things I, I constantly just from a very 10,000 foot view, I'm like, wow, the United States is the storage of the globe, but we haven't added any storage. And so the infrastructure around it, the flow of gas has grown, has doubled and storage has not doubled. I wouldn't say doubles, let's say 60, 70%, but storage hasn't gone up 70%. And so it's not happening now. Like a lot of the things you think about and you ask what up about, it's not now. Because you've thought it out and you've been thinking about it and you've been building models for it, when it gets close or when it happens, you're prepared. And you're gonna, sit, you're gonna situate yourself to have an, 
outsized return when that event happens. Whereas other people be caught flat footed or just kind of watch it happening from the sidelines or unfortunately sometimes get ran over and killed. Yeah. Talking to that, right? It, I, it's noticeable that those organizations that kind of five years ago even started to move towards global gas desks linked by LNG, but start to think it very much about a, a global basis have, have obviously set themselves up tremendously well over the last few years with some exceptions. But um, how do you, how do you create the creativity to sort of come up with these ideas? I mean, is this, how do you get a team together? Do you use a team to do this, you know, to bounce all these ideas off and have that sort of discussion to get to a point where you're, you're starting to familiar, uncover, discover some future trends. How do you instill that in your team, in yourself? You know, how do you go about kind of building this, these conversations to get to a point where, you know, you're, you're coming up with these ideas? Well, for me personally, I, I guess I'm a pain in the ass to my analysts, right? Like, because I just ask a zillion questions, right? You just, and I want to have traders who ask a zillion questions, right? Like, just well, what happens if this? Well, what's going on? Well, can we build a Chinese demand model? What numbers can we pull out? Can we get proxies for demand on this? How do we, how do we get this accurately? You know, and then, then the analysts are like, oh my gosh, I got, I got a bucket load of things to think about and in this puzzle. But I think it's really having curious people asking questions and asking the right question, right? And thinking about, well, how is this market evolving? How are these laws affecting the market? How is climate change affecting the market? In the immediate situation, what if prices collapse here? What is that going to do here? Hey, run me a report. Hey, run me the run me 20 scenarios of weather on TTF and tell me the probability that they'll run out of gas. Just given this weather distribution, the SSD remains constant. You just got to ask all kinds of questions. How much can they turn off? What's the total industry that uh, demand of gas that they can turn off if they need to ration prices? And when you start asking those questions, you get answers. You, you and, and and what price, right? Like what, what, what's the price of fertilizer over there? What's X, Y, and Z? You just have a zillion questions. And some of those lead to, well, this is the strike price and this is where it'll be stable and this is where they'll turn off and this is where S&D and maybe you'll get an edge in the options trade. Maybe you'll understand the asymmetry better and you'll you'll be more confident being short or maybe maybe you'll know where you're going to get long, right? And so you just have to foster an environment of curiosity and you have to have people, traders who are curious and the analysts that can handle the load or can dig and get the answers and, and scour. But to get to those questions, you have to have a backdrop of knowledge to understand what questions are relevant. Are you a, a voracious reader of knowing to care about Chinese fertilizer demand? How do you get to that point? Are you reading 26 hours a day? It's kind of like, yeah, you do have to read it. But it's like a fund. Once you have a fundamental understanding of like kind of what can use gas and always want your head on a swivel, what can use gas or what can turn off gas and what's going on, right? Then you just keep asking those simple questions and building up mo mental models in your head of what can happen and is it significant? Is yeah. this a significant? Is this significant or not? Or is it insignificant now, but in the future it will become significant? Right? I remember one time we, um, I was like, oh, LED light bulbs. Oh, these things use a lot less power. Did some back of the envelope calculations. Wow. All the light bulbs in the United States of America. I wonder how yeah, much LED. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, we, so we were like, can build a model. It's like, okay, this is, this is out of it. We had the people. We had the people who wrote the D, DOE report because I looked at. It, I, I started looking up, you know, just googling and going to the DOE, and they had this power curve of the the reduction in demand for 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 LEDs. And I was like, and, you know, it's like starting in like, like let's say 2018 or 2016, or whatever. And I was like, that's bigger than I thought it was. That's huge. What, what is this number? Let's run our calculations. Then we just had the consultants. We hired, I forget their names. They came in and they built a model for us on what was the demand destruction from LEDs per year. And they had this huge complex model based on what LEDs price were, blah, blah, blah. But it was like two and a half nukes a year starting. That's in there. You yeah. Know? It's, it's, it's in there. Four nukes is uh, like 2,500, you know, is, 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 a, is a B a day, you know? So it was like, Okay, then it, then it accelerated. And I was like, okay, we need to measure this versus the backdrop of how many data centers are going in, use round the clock power and, and, and storage, et cetera, right? But these things come to you, something will come across to you if you're curious and you're, you're into your field, or no matter what you are. I don't care if you're training potatoes, right? Yeah. I'm going to come across. It'll be like LEDs. And you're like, it uses power. I want to know what's happening. You'll ask questions. 
Yeah. Until it's a dead end, right? And and so if this was potatoes, you'd be like, crickets. Crickets, do they eat potatoes? You run it down until you find out whether the cricket's gonna eat up the potatoes and come over here or not, right? Like I'm just making up an example, but it's kind of that that drive to fully understand and explore your world. And that's what's so fascinating about commodities, right? Because it is, I always, you know, where does my passion for it come? You know, it sits, at, the commodities are engine and the artifact of the glo- of the world, right? Like the, whether it's geopolitics, whether it's the environment, weather, climate, energy transition, it, all of these things are available any day to change the price, change the direction, and fundamentally alter the, the nature of commodity flows. And, you know, and I, and I do, you know, we, we've got an episode coming out it will be out by the time listeners listening to this with Owen Johnson on his book, The 40 uh, Classic Crude Oil Trades. And it's amazing kind of the the thread that comes through it is these individuals are just soaks of information, right? And they get, you know, and to be a great commodity trader, you need to have the ability to get that out of individuals and get that out of reports and put up that coherent coherent thesis. But it comes fundamentally with that innate curiosity and a recognition that uh, everything changes on a dime. Yeah, I mean, the best traders, when, I, when I've seen the best traders or traders at their best, they are engrossed in understanding their world. That's all, they think about it all the time, from 10,000 feet all the way down to, you know, from tweezer to sledgehammer level, as I like to say. And they're just, just constantly, constantly understanding what's going on and plugging that and stress testing it and putting in models and going, okay, to give them a greater understanding of feel what's happening, what's going to happen, both short term and long term, right? And continually updating that. And so that's what I think it takes, forget energy, any commodity, right? Energy commodity, any commodity. Like when we, when I talk Texas Power, there's some guys that like, they know all the rules, all the wrecks, all the transmission lines all the future regs, who's putting what, what's in the queue, et cetera. It's like these guys, I'm like, okay, these guys fully, fully understand their corner of the world very well, right, in ERCOT. And they're constantly talking about it. They're obsessed with it. And those are the guys who have the outsized returns right now. Fascinating. So two final questions. One is, what do you think? Energy is back in the news. Volatility is back. Returns are up. All these hedge funds are coming back in. You know, money is starting to flow towards the the sector. What do you think the next five years holds for the gas and power, gas markets, and the opportunity there? I think it's going to be the good old days. I think this is going to be the best years of energy trading in a long while, maybe ever, mainly because of the energy transitions that are being forced upon the market, right? I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just saying they're being forced. Like, yeah, I mean, they're here, they're the front and center, and every... They're here, right? The renewable mandates, they're here. They're not going away. The CO2 mandates, they're not going here. The rise of electric vehicles, they're here. They're going to be bumping up their commodity constraints soon, right? Selling uh, 5 million vehicles is great. W- what happens when you're selling 20 million vehicles a year? You know, and that's going to have an impact on, on, on the energy markets, right? The government's making it more difficult for drilling or not. That's going to have an impact. The rise in the competition globally between natural gas and coal and global demand energy use, right? That's something that's going on. I mean, there's so many things going on, right, that are trying to get us to this promised land, right? Renewable energy, renewable cheap energy. But along the way, the infrastructure that goes in and the policies that go in, they don't go in smoothly on a nice smooth ride. This is going to be a rocky ride with Mother Nature is one of the biggest fundamentals on top of it, right? So we're going to have a lot of fun in the next five years. It is just, I I once uh, sat down, I was giving a talk to someone. I said, we are in the biggest energy infrastructure change ever in the history of the United States of America. If you look at the mandates for the renewables and solar, state by state. Yeah. You've, You've never seen anything like this ever. Right. Yeah. The amount of infrastructure change that's going on globally. Right. We're talking we've had Jeff Curry on and, and this is a trillions of dollars to completely. You know, it's, it's a new industrial revolution. And one, unlike we saw with digitization, where it's relatively capital light. Right. You know, it wasn't very capital intensive. This is going to be an incredibly 
capital intensive, technology driven transition. And yeah, established markets, as you say, are going to degrade. There's no outright winners. It's probably going to take a whole range of technologies. And it's going to be a, yeah, I mean, all those things add up to it being a, a pretty volatile and challenging, but also a lot of opportunity in the environment as well. Yeah, you have you have all these links and delinkages, massive infrastructure going in, massive impacts on commodity prices, massive arbitrages that will happen, open and close. And then you have Mother Nature on top of it, ready to knock us out at any moment, right? <laughs> ready to blow up your thesis in a second, right? And so it's geopolitical events, right? Like you got Russia, Ukraine situation. I mean, it's just so much happening. And this is in a rush, right? It's it's kind of this mandate, right? Like by 20X, we want to have this. So you have this huge up on high powers that be dictating the way this market is going to go. And, you know, sometimes they're going to get their way and sometimes they're not, but it's not going to get layered smoothly, right? It's not going to match, supply and demand are not going to match exactly in yeah. any commodity as these changes happen. And so massive opportunities, massive, massive, massive opportunities. Yeah. And, and the same story is for talent, right? There also, there is an equally has been a lack of investment in talent. Who is going to participate in this, right? It's going to be incumbent, you know, existing people with a skill set already, many of whom are, you know, more advanced in their careers, maybe less risk seeking than they were. And you've also got this other challenge of going right to the back to the beginning of the discussion, the best place to be if you were a Yale or Harvard grad in 1997 was Enron. Whereas today, how is the industry going to attract people into this sector with the backdrop of ESG, et cetera? And, and how are we going to communicate the story that if you really want to be front and center of energy transition, this is the place to be? Yeah, it's tough because, you know, as a small hedge fund, it's like, oh, we can disappear overnight. We're not Goldman Sachs. We're not getting bailed out, right? Or Morgan Stanley who got bailed out, right? And trying to demonstrate them to like, this is where you want to be. This is what's going to happen. Like, look at these scenarios that pop up, right? And they, some of them have been building over time, right? Like, you know, you have over in Europe, like they're shutting down nukes, putting all this intermittent energy on. And then they're like, oh, wait, we didn't invest in natural gas. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have storage. We got problems when this scenario happens, right? And and that's, that's happening everywhere, right? Like these, the, the, the lofty goal is being terribly executed. It'll eventually get there, right? They're just like, well, this is the price we have to pay. Well, that price they have to pay shows up in distortions in the curve, price blows out, scarcities, and then oversupplies, right? And so it's just going to be a fun, beautiful mess over the next five years is my, is my, <laughs> is my, my uh, prediction. Excellent. Well, good for both our businesses. Yeah. Gotta survive, you know. You just gotta survive. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, it's been a fantastic conversation. I did want to ask because you you have an incredibly rich life, dare I say it, and all the things that you do. That curiosity extends well beyond the uh, the energy markets. But um, you are also an author. You wrote uh, the book Die with Zero. <laughs> Can you just give us a couple of minutes on that? I'd love to just you know for everyone to hear the story behind that. So, I mean, I've always had questions about like how to get the most out of my life. What's it all for? What's the money for? When do you want to be rich, right? Everybody wants to be rich young. Well, what's the reason you want to be rich young? And, and you know, to try and make a long story short is, is that I wanted to save my own life. I wanted to optimize it so that when it was, you know, I'm in hospice or at the end of my life, right, that I'm not regretting not living my life fully. I didn't want to accumulate a bunch of assets or capital just to accumulate a bunch of assets and capital, right? I don't want to be a I don't want to be a rat on a wheel and not get the cheese. I'll run on the wheel, but I want to eat the cheese. And I think a lot of people have become rats on the wheel and they don't get the cheese and time periods in their life past them. And they haven't optimized their life for fulfillment. They have optimized their life for wealth. So somehow there was this great magic trick that happened where it was like, oh, you're not optimizing your life to get the things you want. This is the only thing you're going to want. We're going to trick you and you're going to optimize for that. And so I wrote the book Die With Zero, which is basically a counterfactual regret minimization algorithm for net fulfillment. <laughs> right? That's a mouthful, right? What it means is, is what if analysis to make sure that you don't regret your damn life. So you have zero regrets. Yeah. Right? Obviously, zero regrets is obviously the goal. We go to church. We don't stop going to church because we can't 
be Jesus, right? We still try and be Jesus-like or Moses-like or whatever your religion is, right? You know, that's the goal. You don't ever perfectly get there. But I wanted to write a book that allowed me to minimize waste of my life. Yeah. There's a copy on my uh, coffee table, and I saw the eldest kid raise an eyebrow at it. So um, <laughs> 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 did you, did you, did you like the plan? Well, it's been a, a really enjoyable discussion. Very much thank you for your time. And uh, I hope that we can have you back on in a, in a couple of years and, uh, and see where we're at. Cause I think, uh, see if they didn't get me, right? <laughs> well, and again, I think the backdrop to this, and I think the, the, what's fascinating is there are so few organizations and individuals, more importantly, that have managed to stay relevant and stay successful over the long period, over the last 20 years, and what's been an incredibly volatile space that's only going to get more volatile. And I think one of the takeaways for all of us is that you can keep relevant by keeping curious. Yes, that is the main thing is, is like, understand that nothing is static, be curious enough to explore your world and just have that same, um, same curiosity as like when you first got out of college and you were learning about the underlying of your commodity, right? Like you just had to hoover in a bunch of information. Well, I, I think it's, it's even getting great, right? I think you actually, us old dogs need to up our curiosity. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks again. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.com. Dot global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening.